Hello, uh, you're watching Rappler Talk. I'm Miriam Grace Go. I hope you're having a good day, as I am, because I am fangirling right now. <laughs> Our guest is um, a Filipino author, and she's actually ba she's a Cebuana, but based in the United States mm -hmm. now. And um, she's visiting here to relaunch the Philippine version of her novel. This is When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. Um, it's being distributed now by UST Publishing House. And we will hear more from Ms. Cecilia Manguera Brainard. Thank you for coming. Hello, Gigi. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm excited because um, I had a, the old edition of the book. Um, please tell us more about When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. Okay, to tell you the truth, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept is 28 years old, right. imagine. So it started out first as Song of Yvonne, and it was published by New Day. And as it turned out, uh, Dutton Penguin in the United States, and you're holding a Dutton Penguin version, um, published the book under an, this title, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. Um, as time went on, Dutton Penguin actually discontinued it. Uh, but fortunately, University of Michigan Press picked it up. Mm -hmm. So it's been in print all this time, which is, which is, uh, which is, like, which is good, mm -hmm. you know. Um, now, one of the issues and, um, which, is, which makes me really happy about the Philippine edition is that the book is simply too expensive for Filipinos to buy. Uh, I think University of Michigan Press is now selling it for about $20. Mm -hmm. So 20 times 50, you know, for a soft cover. Also, it's just difficult to access. Mm -hmm. So I happen to have been connected with uh, USD Publishing House because they published my two other novels and um, they expressed interest in When the Rainbow Goddess Wept, and so we, we did it. Hmm. So. Please reintroduce the younger readers to When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. Yes. Okay. When the Rainbow Goddess Wept, in a nutshell, is a coming-of-age story of a young girl named Yvonne during World War II in the Philippines. Hmm. Um, basically, I used a lot of stories that, my, that I had heard from my parents hmm. Um, who were in the guerrilla movement during World War II. I myself, I was born after the after war, the war yes. but I, I guess I was a snoop, and I must have listened to mm. stories you know, of the older folk. Mm. And this was a very traumatic time for them, not just for my parents, but their generation. Mm. And so growing up, I would hear these stories about, oh, when the Japanese were here, when so-and-so was mm. killed, and so on and so forth. Mm. Now, to tell you the truth, when I set out to write this first novel, I did not declare that I would write a war novel. Hmm. It was actually, my intention was something else. First of all, I was experimenting. I wanted to find out if I could write something long, hmm. aside from short stories. And I, saw, I explored this time of my life in Cebu when my mother had a best friend and I was about nine years old and I had a best friend and it was all very pleasant and mm. charming, but there was no story. Mm. But when I looked at the draft 200 pages later and a lot of rejections later, and I really paid attention, I realized that the characters kept talking about the war. Mm. So the characters have come to life. Mm. Um, and they would just keep going, do you remember when? Do you mm. remember when mm. this happened to us? And so on. So it took, uh, took a while. I was scared, actually, to go there because they always say in creative writing classes, write about what you know. No. And so what did I know about the war? I was born after the war. Um, then I happened to see a movie. If you see it on Netflix or, you know, um, Hope and Glory, mm. and it's a World War II no uh, movie mm. set in England. And it was a little boy during World War II. And it was something about that movie that made me go, ah, there's a connection here. Mm. So then I went back and I took my little girl and I put her back from the 1950s to 1941 40. and then started mm. the novel. And you use a lot of folklore elements. Yes, yes. Mm. The, um, the epic songs. Um, 
Interestingly, the first version of this, the title was Song, Song of, of Yvonne. Yvonne. Yvonne is the main character, the nine-year-old girl. Correct, correct. She is a nine-year-old girl. She becomes older as the war moves along. But Yvonne had a... Um, the cook in her house was an epic singer who had lost her singing Sing voice, voice, but she could still tell stories. And Yvonne would always follow her around, and Yvonne learned the, the epics from her. Mm. Um, in fact, I want to point out that the epic retellings are based on our actual mm. ancient uh, Philippine epics. Mm. It happened that I was in an epic group uh, at UCLA mm -hmm. with some other Filipinos, and they were mostly folklorists and anthropologists, they're very academe. Mm. Um, and we would study these ancient epics. They, at that time, and I don't know if they're still alive, but researchers would go up to the deep mountains and they would tape record our epic singers yes. and then they would uh, transcribe them and they would translate them yeah. and the work was actually tedious to read but I love them and so I made it my mission to retell them in simple language yeah. now as I was writing the novel the World War II novel uh, I just was experimenting and I started integrating them yeah. and it seemed to work yeah. and in fact it turned out that it is the song of Yvonne, this war story. So it, it sort of worked out. Um, the, I think that the epic uh, retellings that are woven in here, the, the myth, uh, folkloric, if you will, um, gave it enough of a difference to have made Dutton Penguin uh, and other, you know, University of Michigan uh, treasure the book. Um, yeah. They say that it's it's both unique because you are telling a story in the context of the Philippines and at another time in history, but at the same time it's universal because it's from a, the point of view of a child. Yes, yes. Thank you. You were that <laughs> child. Was, people are saying it's this is largely autobiographical. So, were you Yvonne? Are you Yvonne, or should I even ask an author that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, because there were two little girl uh, characters, Esperanza. Esperanza and Yvonne. And Esperanza was naughty. And I Yvonne was more even keeled. And when I actually, I actually tried to write from Esperanza's yes. point of view, but she could not, she was not a good narrator. Hmm. She was too katag, -katag. Hmm. So it was not working. Katag katag is Yeah, katag katag is It means kind of like, you know, just disorganized and she, she couldn't keep Kalat. it together. Kat, yeah, Kalat. there it is. Hmm. Or, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, Yvonne was a better observer or, and a better storyteller. Mm -hmm. So it worked out that way. Um, I don't know. We are always, when fiction writers we we are in a, a in little bit exactly your so i'm a little bit of the naughty esperanza mm -hmm. i'm a little bit of the you know mm -hmm. nice Yvonne. so it's something like that yeah. um i did steal from the or modeled my mother angeling who's a little bit high strung and good looking mm -hmm. and my father was the engineer nando and he mm -hmm. was an engineer yeah. and he was in mindanao mm -hmm. in the guerrilla mm -hmm. movement yeah but you started you said you started your interest in writing when you were nine after your father died. Tamamba. It's true, Gigi. What happened was that um, I actually wrote him stories. I was just nine years old or ten, you know, and I would miss him. So I would write him little updates about mm -hmm. my life. Uh, it was a way of connecting with him. And then I graduated from those little scraps of paper to those pink lock and key diaries. My sister gave me one. I loved it. You could lock it up. And so I started writing, and I just loved the process. And I would write these really horrible poems, but 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 I fell in love with words, mm. you know, and and words on paper. Uh, so it was like that. And even now, I still journal. Mm -hmm. uh, I keep it going. When were you first published? Where? When? When? Oh. Uh, ah, I will tell you. Uh, high school at uh, St. Teresa's College mm -hmm. <laughs> in our journal. Mm -hmm. ko na. Is, was it poetry or fiction? I think it was an attempt at fiction. I'm not sure anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then, okay, so that was probably the first. I don't, I, I think I still have it at home. Mm -hmm. At some point in time, some nun sent it to me, you know? And then, 
for fun in the summers I wrote this uh, parang society column but from a teenage point of view when I was a teenager in the summers hmm. so I would get the little Cebu gossip. newspaper who, yes. which published it uh, I believe the Republic okay I, I think it's defunct now hmm. so I just it actually, at one point, it belonged to the family, so it was very easy. I talked okay. to the editor. The editor said, sure. Can we write a column yeah. for our newspaper? Yeah. Okay. So, and it was the little parties that we went to. And yung parang society column nga na I won. So, but it was fun. Mm. And again, it was like, how nice it is to see your name mm. in print, you know, na parang may byline. But so. when did you decide that, you know, literary writing is something you would do full-time or for most of your days? When I took it seriously. Um, because I was already kind of dabbling. There would be these little stories mm. that would come out and they were kind of really awkward. But And then the thing of it was that I wanted to be a filmmaker. Okay. So it wasn't like I pursued uh, storytelling that way. It was another kind of storytelling I wanted to do. Did you make any films? Um, I had a couple student films, yeah. but um, I was talking to somebody uh, earlier. What happened was two things. It's a very expensive medium. Yeah. Number two, it's very collaborative. And number three, by the time you got done with the product, because everybody put their two cents worth in. It's not your work it's anymore. Not your work. You, you wouldn't even recognize it, you know? So that was one of the things that kind of uh, discouraged me a little bit about it. So. Um, I had children, and when they were very young, I stayed at home. Mm. And it was actually when I stayed at home that I, w I started writing. Mm. So you were in the States already? I was started. in the States, and I was not a young woman anymore. anymore. Yeah, oh. I mean, I had children. How old were you when you took literary writing series? Uh, let me see. Well, my first book came out in 1987. Uh, so, I mean, and then I was writing before that. Um, but this this period in your life where you were you 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 decided to stay home with the kids and just do writing. When was this? Uh, well, the first one was born 1970, and then siguro mga 1981 because the third kid, it was just impossible in the United States to work, take care of three children, children. and you know all of this. So at this point, I went all right. I'm gonna be a housewife, mm. mother and housewife. Mm. So that kid was born 1981, mm. and so I was there. Uh, so 81, and so I was spending that time. So it's not too late for those who are no. aspiring to. No, not right. at all. And even even for those who are older, it's mm. never too late. Mm. Never. Yeah, I remember you had a short story in a couple got sense. One of the stories where the 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 woman character was, you know carrying a child, she was craving a particular flavor of ice cream. Do you remember that? And then she had to ask her husband to look for it in the middle of the night or something. Acapulco and Sansa? In that collection? In that collection. I just can't remember the title. But anyway, was that was you also when you were starting to write Staying at Home. I don't remember this. Oh, I know what it is. It's the one set in San Francisco. Yes. The butterscotch. Yeah, butterscotch. Yes. Oh, God, I love that story. Mm. Um, actually, it was my husband, or the protagonist's husband, husband. who wanted the, the ice cream. cream. Ah, okay. You, but, you know, then the wife and the pregnant, the very pregnant mm. wife and husband take, you know, go, it, run around San Francisco looking for this ice cream, the butterscotch uh, ice cream. Um, and then they finally get the ice cream because the ice cream guy, even though he's closing, feels sorry for the pregnant <laughs> Why? protagonist. Yeah. And it actually is based somewhat on fact. Fine, okay. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm surprised you remembered it, but it is uh, a nice story. Thank um, you. In, in the U.S., you, you, you do workshops, you do talks, and you've edited a couple of volumes written by young writers, right? For this film, um, writers... Um, actually, they're not uh, stories by, it's for. For. Okay. For. for. So, I'm, uh, yes, I did um, Growing Up Filipino 1, uh, Stories for Young Adults, yeah. and then the, a second volume, uh, which actually received really very nice mainstream reviews mm -hmm. from book lists and Publishers Weekly and so on. Mm -hmm. And 
continues to be relevant and mm -hmm. continues to be used. What inspired the project? Uh, it's very interesting actually because I was talking to Gwen Galvez who, is, who was with Anvil mm -hmm. and um, we were just talking, you know, I was, Anvil had been my publisher and we were talking about my book then. But then she mentioned that um, we need young adult books mm -hmm. at that time. And so I said, oh, well, that's interesting. So I just kind of like embraced the project. Mm -hmm. And um, it was actually also needed in, for among Phil Ams, mm -hmm. just as badly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it continues to be useful. Why, why do you think was it needed by Phil um, young people? Because there's probably uh, really uh, a lack of, of uh, material. Well, that's not true. It's better now mm -hmm. because now we have uh, writers like Randy Rebai and uh, Kelly, yeah. uh, some other Phil M writers. But especially, say, eight years ago or, or earlier, there was just nothing. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely very little material for young ad Phil M um, young, young adults. adults. Did you feel like they, they, they don't have that strong connection back home? The, the fact of it is actually quite a lot of the kids are a little bit, uh, they're having an identity crisis. Um, and I can understand it, you know, because uh, in some places, in fact, I mean, it's really kind of like white America. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not so bad in California or in the big cities. Um, and so it's a little tough on these kids because, I mean, they can get questions like, where do you come, come from? from, when actually they were born, born there, yeah, yeah. and they have to, to learn how to deal with it. Um, so they, for some time, some of them will be wondering, am I Filipino, yeah. am I American? Did your kids experience that? No, we, we, were, we live in, San, in um, Santa Monica, in California, and there's quite a lot of different ethnic groups in there. And so um, they had Asian American friends mm -hmm. and they had all kinds of friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't believe uh, they, they went through that. Um, but the target audience of your collection, you said they were having identity crisis. Um, actually, the, the, a lot of teachers used it in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. So, and I, it was not just for, I think when they were using it in their classrooms, it was also to the benefit of other Her. kids, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so did understand the films more? To under, or the notion of, um, we're not, we're no not one is really first. that different. Okay. You know, you can be Iranian American, mm -hmm. you can be Mexican American mm -hmm. and, and so on, but basically the mm -hmm. same issues are there. Mm -hmm. uh, my yeah. Second generation and a second and third, mm -hmm. you know. It it uh, so it's 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 interesting. I'm I I think they still do have this identity thing sometimes. Mm. I mean, I, I suppose we all do. I'm trying to think uh, you know the angst of growing up and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, but it's not as acute now, I think, mm. than it was before. I think there was a sense of isolation before. And now, with social media, media. and so on, I think that mm. they're more connected with mm. different people. Mm. And so it's less stressful, perhaps, for them. When, when you write fiction or novels, is there, are you conscious about, you know, it has to have a link to the Philippines or whatever just comes naturally? Yeah. That's a good question because in the beginning, or no, okay, <laughs> this is in terms of my evolution as a writer. At some point in time, I did make it my mission to, to connect it because um, it's a long story, but uh, I felt that that, that was what I could offer, you know, that was what I, me, could offer better, you know, than writing some waspy kind of story. Mm. However, having said that, as time went on, I, I became more relaxed. And so I actually have stories from the point of view of a dog, <laughs> or a Spanish priest, mm. or recently a Syrian doctor. Mm. So it, now it's whoever fascinates me. Mm. If I am interested in a character and they sort of root in my head, mm. then I, I can explore it. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then 
sometimes a story comes out. Mm -mm. But when you give talks around, whether here or in, in the States, do you feel like the audience somehow expect, you know, there has to be something Filipino or Asian in your work to make you unique? Do you feel that pressure or expectation? I, pr there probably is, you know, to some degree. Um, because I mean, you know, you're usually I'm invited to talk in Asian American mm. this or Filipino American mm -hmm. that. So then, then there's that agenda na that mm. that's what you're going to be dealing with, mm -hmm. sort of. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I I don't, you know, I don't really care sure. too much anymore <laughs> what, what people listen for the younger <laughs> ones don't care <laughs> don't care too much mm -hmm. about what people expect, expect from you. you but you just have to i know it sounds corny but you really truly have to be true to, to yourself, yourself. Um, because that's where the good stories come from anyway mm -hmm. if people eat in kuyang dapat you know cebuano or whatever it's gonna be really stilted mm -hmm. and corny mm -hmm. but if i just kind of leave it and let it take shape, I have to explore it, then mm -hmm. then some magic can happen. Mm -hmm. Can, not yeah. all the time. <laughs> I, I like how you you spelled Cebu backwards. Uber, Uber. Uber. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. All right, when I started writing about the characters of Cebu and using Cebu as my uh, setting, I would freeze because I felt I had to tell the truth. Seriously, it was like, I can't do that because, you know, it, the woman with horns, for instance, was yeah. based on a character whom we used to see as a kid, mm -hmm. and we'd go, ay, mi sungayan, because, you know, her, she'd a poof on her hair, this kind of thing. So then I fictionalized her, and I, I, I couldn't, I, I was, I was, I couldn't, I, you know, I was trapped into telling the truth. And then one day I was just goofing off, you know, and, and scribble, scribble, and I, I reversed it, ubek. And it was like a dam broke. Suddenly, I could lie hey. and make things about this woman, and she became this sexy widow, and you know all this kind of stuff. So it was amazing to me hmm. that that could happen, you know, just by switching. Living, yeah. yeah. Because I'm surprised that I think it's it's the only place that you spell you, you make fictional, deba. Right? Mostly you would refer to I know real places. I know, I know. Um, but, Yes. So the other thing with Ubek is um, it's not really Cebu. It's a little bit like Cebu, but in my imagination, I've changed the geography around. Mm. So the, the church is really not where the church yes. actually, you know, it, I made it convenient to my mm. story mm. in a sense. I was just telling some people the other night at the book launch that um, I was in a taxi in Cebu. And when, so I looked out the window and I saw a huge graffiti and it was a scenic place with coconut trees and a rainbow and it said Ubek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cebu. okay. I was I went, whoa. You should have taken a photo. I did yeah. I did actually. I'll 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 email it to you. So it was fascinating to mm. me that somehow that has sifted into the consciousness mm. of my fellow Cebuanos. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, I heard that they had a radio station that had Ubek in it. The name of the radio station had Ubek. Mm. So whether or not they've read all my stories, they like the idea yeah, of Ubek. Ubek. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. Mm. OK. Um, what else can we expect from you after this? Ah, so I will, I don't know. Um, I, I have written three novels. It's, uh, I can tell you it's not easy to write three novels, and it's quite demanding. Um, and then the other thing I can tell you is that last December, like magic, I started sketching, yeah. drawing. I should have shown the it's sketch, all right. sorry. It's okay. okay. And uh, it, it was like, I, don't, I didn't know where that came from because mm. I can't even draw a straight line, honestly. I had no art interest, whatever, whatever. And in December, suddenly, I started pencil sketching, and I've learned how to do pen and ink and pen and wash. Yeah. So no formal walang tutorials. Training, walang training. Not even YouTube. YouTube uh, tutorials. I, I just on my own, you know, this uh, mga how to, and then observing books. So we were in Portugal, and I got a book. Uh, 
that was pen and wash, and I'm, <laughs> I'm studying how the lines, how did they do this? And Tony Perez, who is here in Quezon City, um, is sort of secretly mentoring me. So he, he actually emails or me messages me, you know, mm. like, mm, you know, you can do this, you can do that kind of thing. Also, Alfredo Rosas is also kind of oh. like mentoring me a little bit. So it's exciting, you know. Um, so it's very fun. But I know I'm never going to be a Van Gogh. I mean, <laughs> you know, but maybe I can do something with it in conjunction with writing. Yes, I was thinking of yeah. that, you know, stories with your own drawings. So that's that's what I'm trying to do, but the energy is going into this um, art. Mm. So I'm trying to do essays that kind of like go with it, mm. but we don't know yet, we'll see. Uh, do you teach or have you You know, I was teaching considered? for a long time and then my husband retired and we've been kind of uh, traveling a lot. Mm. So the teaching sort of fell by the wayside. Although now and then, if I'm invited to lecture or whatever, I'll, I, if it fits my schedule, I do so. But it will be interesting what stories will come out from your travels. I'm excited. You're going to Japan, you said, after this. I'm going to visit Japan for uh, nine days or so, so uh, beginning next week. Mm -hmm. So it'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Haven't been. Okay. One is curious question. Who's the woman in the photo you know that's my mother and if you look at the the newspaper widow the other novel the recent novel in fact which is right here this, this is lovely you should also buy this this is my mother also ah, so yeah, she has she ah, has yeah, turned mag, out ah, well it is the same it's woman what? i didn't notice i got yes same woman <laughs> what happened is that um I would have like a concept for, you know, I'm working with the artist, of course. And ang nangyari was then the, so anyway, it's like, here, let's use my mother's picture. It's better than what you have. Mm -hmm. And then ito naman, uh, there was a picture of my auntie and the, the idea was it would be a kind of like a goddess image and the resolution was too low. So mm -hmm. then I sent my mom's picture. So. So, so here's my mother. The mom is the <laughs> goddess. <laughs> well, she, I'm, I'm sure what, she loves it. It was, was this inspired by This is Pasita photo. Abad. Yeah. Pas, but this is Pasita, Pasita Abad, Abad's yeah. work. Um, Dutton Penguin uh, made arrangements with her to use her work. And so that was what they used in the cover. Mm -hmm. There's a hard cover of that. Mm -hmm. And it's also in this paperback that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and there is actually a Turkish edition that also uses this. Okay. Um, so it's very fun. Oh, you've been translated? Yes, yes. Turkish. It was translated into Turkish. Okay. And how is the reception? As a Turkey? Well, I, you know, I mean, it was a long time ago, so I think they had it uh, running and then mm. they, they kind of, and then, you know, Turkey, mm. <laughs> where it is now, I'm not sure. Okay. So, but. Um, we happened to have been in Turkey and I actually visited the publishing house and the editor there and so on and it was very nice and they were very nice to me. Yeah. Um, so it was it was nice. It was very good. Has anybody thought of translating this to Cebuano? Well, uh, so this is an interesting concept that a lot of writers uh, discuss about using uh, our own language. Mm. Ang problema dyan is actually the reading Cebuanos read in English. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I'm not sure. And, and so, you know, I talk to other writers, you know. Mm -hmm. I know we have to, you know, develop our ganang ganang. And I'm going, but aren't you shrinking mm -hmm. your reading market? Mm -hmm. You know, if you, kung Cebuano lang yan, you're cutting out Tagalog mm -hmm. spa, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It's, it's actually mm -hmm. in debate right now. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things. Where do you, where do you stand? Where do I do stand? Um, I think I'm more, you, it's like this. If you have the talent and the ability to use Bisaya or Tagalog or Kapampangan, whatever it is, and it is the language that expresses your thoughts and feelings, the best, then go, go for, for it. it. Go, mm -hmm. go for it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, now for me, it's a little bit embarrassing to say, but I am more literate with the English language. Mm. My Cebuano is really quite poor. Mm. 
mm. you know, especially because I haven't really been using it a lot. But even during, when even when we were kids, when you were my kids. mother and aunties would always go, ay, nako, you're so, bueno, so lousy, you're gonna. So, um, they're more important to me. Mm. There are more important things than language. Language is important. Mm. But when you're telling a story, there are things like character mm. and character development and conflict and so on and so forth. Mm. So to me, the language is a tool, mm. which is why I can understand Dostoevsky, mm. which was originally in Russian translated, and I can understand you know, these other foreign languages, uh, Gar Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Okay. Spanish translated into English mm. because there is more to it than mm. the language. Mm. So that's that sort of it's a tool. Mm. I look at the language as a tool. Mm. But I mean, if it's a tool you're very good at, go. Mm. And then if your work is really good and if you know yeah. a, a wider market wants it, they're gonna get mm. it and translate it. Mm -mm. Yeah, this I was telling my friends that the the, the reason you you are a delight to read is it's smooth reading. It, there's no, you know, s there are writers who would really make an effort to make it difficult to read so that they would, you know, sound smarter. Smart. <laughs> and so, Smart. but this, this, this one is like, you know, you're just listening to a storyteller Thank and you. then, but then it carries you to other worlds as they should. No? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, early on, I learned that it's, for me, mm. it works best if I use just straightforward. Yes, that's the word. In a way, simple English. language. I simple mean, not, language. not that it's simplistic, but directo na lang. Mm. Wag na yung maraming mga kuchu kuchu yeah. or whatever, yeah, whatever. True, true. You know, what's the point of giving your readers mm. nga difficulty trying to look up? Ano bang meaning yeah, ito yung yeah, yeah. Or is there some hidden meaning correct, somewhere? Correct. Yeah. Directo na. I mean, if you're telling mm. a story about a little girl, who, you know, and mm -hmm. then just say it. Because you go straight to the magic of, you know, the story when you have to, don't have the language to it's called struggle the, with. The fictive dream. Okay. You create a fictive Fic dream, dream and you don't want to break it. Mm, true. <laughs> okay. Okay. Last words to encourage our young aspiring writers. I'm sure they would love to hear from you. Okay. So I have some suggestions to those of the, the young people and not so young who like to write. Yeah, I like that point. Eh, na late na pala when you decided, I'll yeah, go serious yeah, with this. Yeah. Number one, you read a lot because it is so, it is so connected to writing. And you want to read the, the stuff that you want to write. If, you're gonna, if you want to be a poet, read good poetry. If you want to be a fiction writer, read fine fiction. If you want to write uh, personal essays. So, because these are your teachers. More than the teachers you have in classrooms, you're going to learn straight from these books. How do I write dialogue? What works? Mm. What is plot? And so on and so forth. So that's number one. Number two, I, it is important to, for me, I think, don't be proud. Take a class or two on how to write, mm. creative writing, because you will learn tricks. You will learn what is di good dialogue, what is, you know, uh, what are cliches, how to avoid them, uh, and so on. Mm. Um, I know that the first stories I wrote, I did them on my own. And later on, when I took writing classes, I learned what cliches were and don't avoid passive sentences, you know, things like that. So mm -hmm. you can fine tune your work better. Um, and number three, not to be discouraged. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not easy, but it is not impossible. And I, I know there's a lot of work now na parang yung ma, but for me, I think one should try, I meet some writers and they want to be published so badly. They want to tailor their work to what they think is marketable. marketable. I okay, might, that's sad. My advice is don't do that. You know, you have your own individual story and you find it mm. and then you tell it mm. in the best way you can. Don't, don't try to come up with something that you think will sell. Mm. Yun lang. Okay. <laughs> and good luck. Okay. Okay.
Thank you for Thank you. guesting here on Rappler Talk. Get Miss Cecilia Manguera Brainerd's book. Salamat. Really good read. <laughs> Thank you, Gigi. As I said, I'm a fan. <laughs> Thank you for watching Rappler Talk. Great. Miriam Grace, go. Thank you.